thank you, David. Thanks for this opportunity to report from the front of today's global energy revolution. Uh, I offer this talk uh, <clears throat> in honor of energy pioneer, physicist, and friend Rob Sokolow, whose Monday 40-year celebration at Princeton I have to miss in order to join you here. Ford's auto industry, Edison's electricity industry, and Rockefeller's oil industry changed the world. And if Ford and Edison took a very long nap on one of their car camping holidays together and woke up and saw their businesses today, they would recognize almost everything except the electronics. And yet their industries faced vast disruption as 21st century technology and speed collide head on with 20th and even 19th century institutions, rules, and cultures. And now the first two of these three great industries, autos and electricity, are coming together to eat the third, oil. As we might imagine Ford mischievously muttering to Edison, let's see what happens when electricity displaces gasoline and then those electric cars add flexibility and cheap distributed storage and make batteries cheap for all, thus helping the grid integrate variable solar and wind power so distributed renewables replace giant power plants and their fossil fuels. Now using plain rather than physics language, the energy saved worldwide since 1990, two thirds by more efficient end use technologies, now supports more energy services than oil does. If the United States total primary energy use had kept growing in lockstep with GDP since 1975, we'd have used this much energy. Uh, instead, we cut that use by more than half Meanwhile, renewable output doubled with 30 times less cumulative impact than the savings, but getting virtually all the headlines because renewables are visible on the roof or the skyline, but energy is invisible and the energy you don't use is ineffable. Around 1975, US government and industry all said that the energy needed to make a dollar of GDP could never drop. A year later, I heretically suggested it could drop 72% in 50 years. So far, it's dropped 58% in 43 years. Yet, just the innovations already added by 2010 can save another threefold, twice what I originally thought, at a third the real cost. And today, that looks conservative, because optimizing buildings, vehicles, and factories as whole systems, not as piles of parts, can often make very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into increasing returns. The evidence for that surprise is in a new peer-reviewed paper, just search for how big is the energy efficiency resource. Uh, here's a short summary which I'll amplify in a 1045 session Monday morning. Unlike oil or copper, most of the just discovered energy efficiency resources cost less than current production because these new several fold larger savings come not from adding more or fancier widgets, but from using fewer and simpler widgets, but more artfully chosen, combined, timed, and sequenced. So while metal ore bodies and oil reservoirs are finite assemblages of atoms, energy efficiency resources are infinitely expandable assemblages of ideas, depleting only stupidity, a very abundant resource. Uh, here are a few examples. My wife Judy and I live here 2,200 meters up in the Colorado Rockies near Aspen where temperatures used to dip as low as minus 44 Celsius. But our house does no combustion. That's so 20th century. Super insulation and ventilation heat recovery combined with big super windows that insulate like 16 or even 22 sheets of glass but look like two and cost less than three. So the building is 99% passive solar heated, 1% active solar. Super efficiency added less construction cost than eliminating the heating system saved. Saving 99% of space and water heating energy, 90% of household electricity and half the water, all paid back in 10 months with 1983 technology. Today's is better and cheaper. The central atrium seen here in a February snowstorm has so far produced 75 passive solar banana crops. Uh, without needing to look like this, our house helped inspire several th uh, hundred thousand European passive buildings that likewise have no heating and roughly normal construction costs. In Germany, reportedly two-thirds of them are retrofits. 
This works from Old Snowmass to Bangkok, a climate range that includes practically everyone on Earth. Wherever you live, integrative design gives many benefits from each expenditure. So the white arch in the middle of the upper middle photo, or at the top of the photo, uh, actually has 12 functions, but it has only one cost. Such integrative design is how our Empire State Building retrofit saved 38% of its energy with a three-year payback. But three years later, our cost-effective Denver retrofit saved 70% making this half-century-old federal complex more efficient than the then best new U.S. office, which in turn is less than half as efficient as our own net positive no mechanicals office uh, in the coldest North American climate zone. Now there's a Bavarian building using three-fifths less energy than ours. Yet all these technologies existed more than a decade ago. What mainly improved is not so much technology as design, the way we choose and combine technologies. By 2050, at historically reasonable rates, buildings which use three-fourths of U.S. electricity can become three or four times more efficient, saving $1.4 trillion net present value with a 33% internal rate of return. So those savings are worth four times their cost. And industry can accelerate, doubling its energy productivity with a 21% internal rate of return. In both those sectors, better pipe and duct design, saving 80 or 90 percent of friction, could, if fully deployed, save roughly half the world's coal-fired electricity with extremely juicy returns. Yet this remains largely unnoticed and unpracticed because it's not a technology. It's a design method, and few people yet think of design as a scaling vector. No magic is required, just physics. To wring out friction, we simply use big pipes and small pumps, not small pipes and big pumps. And to eliminate elbows, we lay out the pipes first, then the equipment, and lay out supply pipes non-orthogonally as if they were drains. Thus, our colleague Peter Rumsey's retrofit of the Oakland Museum's condenser water pumping loop cut the pumping energy by three-fourths with a two or three-month payback and eliminated 15 pumps that will never again waste energy and maintenance costs. Then repiping the chilled water loop and adding variable frequency drives doubled the flow and saved 85% of the energy. What do such savings mean for the three-fifths of global electricity that's used in motors have to run pumps and fans? Well, in a typical pumping system, from the fuel burned in the power plant to the end use, many successive losses compound, so only a tenth of the energy in the fuel comes out the pipe as flow. But now turn those compounding losses around backwards from right to left into compounding savings, and every unit of flow or friction you save in the pipe saves 10 units of fuel cost emissions and global weirding back at the power plant. And as you go back upstream, the components get smaller and cheaper, so the total capital cost goes down. Then we can also make the drive systems 80 or 90 percent smaller and at least twice as efficient by a whole system retrofit using not just the usual two improvements, but 35. Starting with the right seven gives 28 more as free byproducts, saving several fold more energy at about a fifth the unit cost. What about oil? Well, nearly half of U.S. oil fuels automobiles, so let's start with their physics. Just a fifth of a modern U.S. car's fuel energy reaches the wheels and moves the car. Of that tractive load, nearly half, rising as the cube of speed, heats the air that the car pushes aside. Most of the rest heats the tires and road. Only the last 6% or so of the fuel energy accelerates the car and then heats the brakes when you stop. But 19 20 of the mass you're accelerating is the heavy steel car. So just a 20th of that 6%, or about 0.3% of the fuel energy, ultimately moves the driver. Not very gratifying after one and a third centuries of devoted engineering effort. Both acceleration and rolling resistance depend on mass, which therefore causes most of the tractive load. Now, automakers cut losses mainly in the red part, the powertrain, where the big losses are. That's harder than reducing tractive load, and it's far less rewarding because saving one unit of energy in the powertrain saves only one unit of fuel in the tank, while saving one unit of energy at the wheels avoids four or five additional units lost in getting that energy to the wheels 
so it leverages five or six units of fuel saved in the tank. Therefore, we should first reduce tractive load, then improve the powertrain, which then shrinks for the same acceleration, saving more mass and also saving capital costs to help pay for the light weighting. Aerospace uses light, strong carbon fiber composites, but automaking needs about a thousand-fold higher volume and lower cost. And that gap seemed unbridgeable until the early 90s when I met Dave Taggart at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. There he had led the clean sheet design of a 95% carbon advanced tactical fighter airframe that was one-third lighter but two-thirds cheaper than the 72% metal base design. That was too radical, so Dave left, and one bounce later, I hired him to lead 19 years ago the complete virtual design with two tier one engineering firms of something I'd invented nine years earlier called a hypercar in the form of this four to six fold more efficient carbon fiber hybrid SUV. Seven years later, our shared design methods helped Toyota create a 70% lighter concept plug-in hybrid. Six years after that, BMW launched mid-volume production of this carbon fiber electric four-seater. Carbon fiber hypercars made at normal cost by our simplified methods could save much more oil than Saudi Arabia lifts. And our manufacturing technology now in the supply chain can make a complex two by two meter uh, carbon fiber part in one minute. Even aluminum fleet vans like this one ton lightened hybrid we developed and road tested nine years ago could save a fifth of US auto fuel and need no subsidy. Now, ultralighting cars can be cost effective even at 2013 carbon fiber prices. Well, that, how do we know? That was proved by this electric car, which I drive, and it reportedly made money from the first unit off the assembly line as its radically simplified design validated the benefits we claimed in the 90s. Sandy Monroe is the auto industry's normally understated cost wizard, and he called this car the most significant vehicle since the Model T and the most advanced vehicle on the planet. Its carbon fiber is paid for by needing fewer batteries. It's paid for by the batteries that its lightness saves, and of course fewer batteries mean faster recharging. Its lightness offsets the battery's weight as well as their cost. Its integrative design compounds saved mass far more than other automakers assume. The manufacturing is radically frugal, confirms the elimination of the conventional body and paint shops, and is much better for workers and overlooked synergies between ultralight materials and electric traction quadruple its efficiency, compromise, and with a lot of driver advantages. In heavy vehicles, we helped Walmart's truck fleet save half its fuel per case in a decade, but that included smarter logistics. Better technology alone, however, naturally including light weighting, can profitably make US 18 wheelers at least three times more efficient and airplanes three to five fold like these decade old designs by Boeing, NASA, and MIT. So even without most of today's revolution in shared connected and electric mobility, the US can greatly enhance total mobility as you see in the subtitle while phasing out oil at an internal rate of return over 17%. We can first get efficient by technologies included or overlooked in the official forecast and use vehicles more productively. Then we can switch fuels, but there's not much left to switch. Uh, super efficient autos can use any mixture of hydrogen fuel cells, electricity, and advanced biofuels. Heavy trucks and airplanes can realistically use advanced biofuels or hydrogen, or trucks could even burn natural gas, but no vehicles will need oil. Any biofuels needed could be made two-thirds from waste without displacing cropland or harming soil or climate. So far, this 2011 graph closely matches the actual oil plus biofuel total. We seem on track. Now these fungible efficiency technologies could make the oil and gas reserves unburnable for climate reasons smaller than the reserves unsellable for competitive reasons, putting oil owners even more at risk for market competition than from climate regulation. The cost of getting U.S. autos completely off oil has fallen from $18 per saved barrel seven years ago to under $10 today, heading below zero in the next six years. So oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. With electricity, as with fuels, both technology and design are moving efficiency into fast forward. 
Prior lighting improvements are being swept away as LEDs in each decade get 30 times more efficient, 20 times brighter, and 10 times cheaper. Soon they'll save an eighth of the world's electricity. What else changes that fast? The rest of the energy transformation, modern renewables. LEDs backwards are PVs, photovoltaics, and they are now less capital intensive than Arctic oil. Their prices meteorite strike has brought solar and in aqua wind power costs below the dash lines. That's the cost of fossil fuels fed into U.S. power stations, often making old coal, gas, and nuclear plants uneconomic just to run. But the electricity transformation is much bigger. We're shifting from molecules and atoms to bits and packets, from hardware to software, from hierarchies to networks. Electricity is changing from centralized, supply-focused, fossil and uranium-fueled and brittle to distributed, customer-focused, renewable, and resilient. And its deepest change is how the information age informs, enables, and organizes customers to take power into their own hands. You know, it's wise to sell customers what they want before someone else does, and customers are figuring out that they can buy fewer electrons, use them more productively and timely, produce their own, and even trade them with each other. For example, Dutch customers can buy renewable electricity directly from other customers on this peer-to-peer -peer website of Van de Bron, literally from the source. A utility executive I know decided to buy his electricity from the guy in the upper left photo because the price was right and it's a really cute piglet. Then he got a long handwritten Christmas card from his electricity supplier. What big utility can dream of such customer intimacy? <laughs> We're shifting from molecules, uh, sorry. Uh, it, indeed, there are powerful disruptors converging on the electricity industry from at least eight directions. These eight Pac-Men of the apocalypse don't just add, they exponentiate. They're not lone wolves, they hunt in packs. They multiply quickly. They can gobble half of utility revenues in the 2020s. Together, they're quickly creating an alien competitive landscape even as more Pac-Man are coming over the hill, breakthrough batteries, blockchain, eliminating reactive power, resilient grid architectures, low voltage DC buildings, and more. Globally, renewables in green are taking over the electricity market. Modern renewables in blue, that's excluding big hydro, pulled ahead of glo global nuclear generation in Magenta in 2016. They quietly passed a trillion watts of installed capacity in 2017. That first terawatt took about 15 years. The next terawatt is set to take about four years, with most made and nearly half bought by China. In 2013, China added more PV photovoltaic capacity than the U.S. had added in total since developing them 59 years earlier. In 2016, China doubled the pace to three football fields per hour. In 2018, China added more PVs in June than the U.S. added all year. If the past couple of decades global growth continued, solar power could supply a fifth of the world's total primary energy in another eight years, thanks to a crucial positive feedback. When renewables get cheaper, we buy more, so they get cheaper, so we buy more. Such increasing returns make most models blow up and keep out running forecasters, as in these forecast fans from the International Energy Agency, raised sixfold for wind and 23 for, 20, for photovoltaics in 15 years, yet always short of reality. Solar capacity is now over 50 times IEA's 2002 forecast, and it's adding more each year than all fossil fuel generators combined. In 2017, modern renewables were 64% of the world's total net additions of generating capacity, thanks to their powerful business case. U.S. wholesale electricity prices now widely exceed the average long-term fixed prices of both wind power and solar power. U.S. renewables do get temporary subsidies, less than the permanent subsidies to non-renewables, yet renewables at or below $30 a megawatt hour, the diamonds, are winning in unsubsidized global markets, and costs keep falling through $20 towards 10 in 2016 alone, the low bids fell 37% for Mexican solar power, 43% for European offshore wind, all in less than a year. Mexico's latest unsubsidized low bids were $19 for photovoltaics, $17 for wind power. And developing nations already dominate these global investments. By next year, renewables 
will beat fossil fuels in every major region on Earth. And if you think uh, solar and wind need storage, median Colorado bids for 30 renewable gigawatts five quarters ago were the hollow squares without storage or the filled squares including storage. In the year just ended, global benchmark prices also fell 35% for lithium ion battery storage on top of a 37% fall the previous year. PV and wind power output do vary, but at least as predictable, predictably as demand does. Reliably integrating them into the grid is no harder and it's probably cheaper than backing up intermittent thermal power plants. Consider the difficult case of Texas, whose grid has no big hydro dams and is not connected to the rest of the country. A 2050 summer week's expected loads can get much smaller and less peaky with efficient use. Then we can make 86% of that annual electricity with wind and PVs and 14% from dispatchable renewables. This 100% renewable supply can then match the load by putting surplus electricity into two kinds of distributed storage that are worth buying anyway, ice storage air conditioning and smart charging of electric autos, and then recovering that energy when needed and filling the last gaps with unobtrusively flexible demand. That yields 100% renewable electricity every hour of the year with no bulk storage and only 5% left over, so the economics should be excellent even at today's prices. Some grid operators do such choreography today. Germany, Italy, and Britain are about a third renewably powered, but four other European countries with modest or no hydropower meet about half to two-thirds of their electricity needs from renewables, adding no bulk storage, and with superior reliability for Denmark and Germany about 10 times ours. The ultra-reliable former East German utility is 42% wind and solar powered and says its CEO could do 60 or 70% without adding bulk storage. So as my colleague Clay Stranger says, the operators have learned to run these grids the way a conductor leads a symphony orchestra. No instrument plays all the time, but the ensemble continuously makes beautiful music. So we have not just one way, bulk storage in Magenta, but about 10 ways to make the grid flexible, reliable, and renewable, sketched here in order of increasing costs. Your actual costs will vary, but bulk storage comes last, not first, so we needn't wait for a storage miracle, though some are emerging, and the market isn't waiting. Grid integration gets even easier with smart bidirectional hookups of parked battery electric cars. Last year, China sold more electric vehicles than the world sold the year before. Next year, the world will have over 200 models. That's because of, and it causes, plummeting battery prices. Now, India, Germany, and automakers like VW, Ford, and GM have such ambitious electric vehicle targets that if the grid did need cheap batteries, they'd arrive a decade or two sooner than expected. Automotive lithium packs in 2018 cost an average of 176 bucks a kilowatt hour, some below 130. That's less than recent predictions for a decade hence. By about 2024, electric vehicles will cost no more to buy than today's gasoline autos. Abundant cheap batteries imply distributed solar everywhere, gas industry distress, the end of thermal power plants, vast distributed storage and demand flexibility, and perhaps much of the grids becoming a stranded asset like phone company copper. This prospect gives utility executives nightmares and venture capitalists sweet dreams. Last year's global sale of 1.8 million plug-in vehicles only hints at what Bloomberg New Energy Finance sees coming from observed price and technology trends, electrifying a third of the fleet by 2040. And yet even these forecasts don't fully reflect five accelerants now in play. Ultralighting, which can save up to two-thirds of the batteries, aggressive electric vehicle policies in many key markets, fee baits akin to the policies that made half of Norway's new cars plug-in models, 20 times the U.S. share, policy does matter, shareable autonomous and mobility as a service business models whose high asset utilization favors electric traction, and monetizing electric vehicles value as a grid resource that can repay up to half their sticker price. Meanwhile, efficient and electric autos are morphing from pigs, that is, personal internal combustion gasoline steel-dominated vehicles, to SEALs, shareable electric autonomous lightweight service vehicles. Those two changes in technology and three in business model are all simultaneous, mutually reinforcing, and vigorously in play. 
India and China are radically speeding this global mobility revolution as the U.S. nears peak personal car ownership in the next five years, so there's a perfect storm brewing for the oil, steel, car, and electricity industries. Assembling all these opportunities, our 2011 U.S. business book, Reinventing Fire, rigorously showed how to triple efficiency and quintuple renewables by 2050, needing no oil, coal, or nuclear energy, and a third less natural gas, while saving $5 trillion, growing the economy 2.6-fold, strengthening national security, and cutting fossil carbon emissions 82 to 86 percent, yet needing no new inventions nor acts of Congress, but with smart city and state policies led by business for profit. The first seven years of this 40-year journey are nicely on track, green actual versus blue proposed, because the private sector smells the $5 trillion on the table. That's exactly what should be happening. These best buys are also the most effective solutions to big global problems that hazard every country's security and prosperity. And if you like any of Reinventing Fire's outcomes, you can support the transition without needing to like every outcome or agree about which outcome is most important. Focusing on outcomes, not motives, can turn gridlock and conflict into a unifying solution to our common energy challenge. Stimulated by those U.S. findings at the G20 two and a half years ago, the Energy Research Institute of China's National Development and Reform Commission published its roadmap for China's energy revolution, aided by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Energy Foundation China, and Rocky Mountain Institute. It details how China can save over $3 trillion, use today's energy seven times more productively, and get 13 times more GDP from each ton of fossil carbon. This roadmap strongly informed the 13th five-year plan, whose energy authors were our steering committee. Extrapolating these on-track U.S. adopted Chinese and similar European findings to the other half of the world could achieve the Paris Agreement's global two-degree climate trajectory uh, about $18 trillion cheaper. Reinvesting in natural systems carbon removal could then reach about a one and a half degree trajectory, still with trillions of dollars left over. Now, incumbent energy suppliers feeling the threat understandably focus on the need for price to exceed cost, but many forget the other part of the business condition, that value must exceed price. If competitors offer a superior value proposition and grab your revenues, it doesn't matter if you can profitably sell what your ex-customers are no longer buying. Markets can then flip with breathtaking speed, as Tony Seba's archival photos show. On Fifth Avenue in 1900, you have to look hard for the first car. Just 13 years later, you have to look harder for the last horse. The non-farm horse market had peaked in 1910 when there were only 3% as many cars as horses. The horse and buggy industry thought it had many decades to adapt, but the Model T got 62% cheaper in 13 years. Car-owning households soared from 8 to about 60% in a decade, three-quarters financed by a GM and DuPont innovation called Car Loans. Today's PV modules just got 80% cheaper in five years, three-quarters of rooftop solar is innovatively financed, and Ford's and Edison's industries are merging to eat Rockefeller's industry. Thus, the pace of transformation is set not by incumbents, but by insurgents who are not inhibited by incumbents' business models, legacy assets, or cultures. Moreover, investors flee before customers do, because capital markets keenly sniff out disruption. And once they think you're in or even headed for the toaster, they don't wait for the toast to get done before they decapitalize you and invest in your successors. Already, $8 trillion have prudently fled the fossil fuel industries. How does this work? Well, carbon tracker investment analyst Kingsmill Bond explains the brutal logic. He says any fast-growing challenger will rapidly take all the growth in a slow-growing market. As a rule of thumb, incumbent sales will peak when the challenger gets to about 3% market share. But remember, most investors seek growth, not mere size, and they try to sell just before sales peak because after that, stagnation strands assets and competition drops prices. So, Bond concludes, renewables are fast-growing disruptive technologies that have reached critical mass and are transforming the global energy system. Investors in incumbent energy companies are at risk. That's why, comparing share price performance, you see that a 2003 startup called Tesla Motors surpassed Ford's and sometimes GM's market cap 
while selling 2 or 3% as many cars. Now electric cars, with just 2% market share, are seen as the inevitable successor, while venerable giants struggle to reinvent themselves and learn that incumbency can be more a liability than an asset. One last thought. The energy transformation I've summarized is not just fundamental, it's elemental. The first industrial revolution was the age of carbon, creating our prosperity and the world's mightiest industries from coal and oil and gas. But now that obsolete age of carbon is giving way to the modern age of silicon. Silicon microchips, telecommunications, and software turn people from isolated to networked, systems from dumb to smart, and grids from analog to digital, and potentially from dirigist to democratized. Silicon power electronics make electricity interconvertible and precisely applicable, replacing fiery molecules with obedient electrons. And silicon solar cells enable the ascent of energy from mining the fires of hell to harvesting the breath and radiance of heaven. So let's discuss how to enable the new energy system not protect the old so the global energy transformation can move at the pace and cost of design and software, not of infrastructure, and can be not constrained by the inertia of incumbents, but sped by the ambition of insurgents. Thank you all for your good work and your kind attention. What a wonderful talk. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for starting this day with good news. <laughs> Thanks. We have a time for a few questions. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, you didn't say much of anything about the jobs and employment potential of uh, renewable energies and uh, energy conservation. But I was just reading a, uh, I think it was a 2017 report from the Department of Energy on energy and employment. And it said that something like 500,000 jobs are already in existence in the United States in solar and wind power alone, despite the fact that only maybe a few percent of the energy generation is in those areas. Can you comment on that? Sure. There, there are far more jobs in renewables, not to mention efficiency, uh, than in coal, which is more comparable to, I think we have about as many coal miners as yoga instructors. Uh, I'm not to, not to say that they shouldn't have a just transition, but it's a very manageable problem. Uh, and when you add up all the renewable and efficiency jobs, they're actually a good deal more than in fossil fuel. So uh, I want a, a big American car with tail fins. It's my right as an American. How do we deal with cultural biases and overcoming feelings of self-entitlement so people will actually move toward things that are you know, necessary for our environment and our, and our planet? Well, since uh, the way we enforce U.S. efficiency standards was changed some years ago for cars and light trucks, so it's based on size, not weight, we've decoupled those two and therefore broken the incentive when they were coupled for the mass arms race where you know, you, you drive an SUV and he'll drive an a 18-wheeler and she'll drive a locomotive. That was utterly nuts. Uh, so now <clears throat> uh, automakers are incentivized to make cars which are as big as you want, as long as they fit in your garage door, uh, <clears throat> which makes them more comfortable, certainly more protective, uh, but also to make them light so that they're not hostile but rather efficient and equally or, be or more safe, and therefore you can end up saving lives, oil, and money, and climate all at the same time. So I, and, and the fee baits I described, a, a fee for buying an inefficient new car, a rebate for buying an efficient new car, can be done by size class. So you're, you can apply social criteria and discount rates to buying a car of the type and size that you want, uh, and the fees can pay for the rebates, so it's politically attractive because it's revenue neutral. Thank you. Over there. Hey, how you doing? That was a fantastic talk. It actually gave me a lot of hope. I've been thinking about this issue significantly. Uh, one of the things I've run into, though, is that uh, a lot of the, the, techno the technological advances you speak of uh, rely on rare earth materials. 
Uh, so can you, have you done like a second order analysis of how the costs and scarcity isn't, of those materials increase as you try to roll out these, these large working. changes? Uh, yes, the, I, I have the assumptions the, the incorrect. Timer. Uh, although very widespread. And uh, if you look in Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, I had an article in there uh, a couple of years ago about rare earths, why not to worry, I believe it's called. Uh, so if you, if you Google something like uh, uh, Lovin's Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, rare earths, it should pop right up. And earlier I had the same thesis in uh, Joint Force Quarterly, which is the magazine of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Thank you. If you, if you can't find it, uh, write me and I'll, I'll get it to you. Over here. Yeah. I can't see you with the lights, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, quite a few of the things you addressed in order to make this possible is consumer-focused changes, like consumers being able to shift demand and purchase an electric car and possibly install distributed solar. How can we address the inequities that creates between the people that have the capital to make those purchases and the people that will be left behind? By making sure that nobody's left behind by designing uh, both business models and policies properly. Uh, a very important issue and not that difficult to do. That's why, for example, uh, we have in, I think, 31 states, legislative authority for PACE bonds. Uh, go to PACE, P-A-C-E, now, pacenow.org to find out more about that. But it's a way of getting all the capital, let's say, for your landlord to fix up uh, rental housing uh, for water and energy efficiency and renewables without needing any capital up front, and everybody ends up with a positive cash flow from day one. Uh, similarly, uh, most uh, rooftop solar is uh, uh, third-party financed without down payment. And actually, the economics can be good enough. I, I tried on a, one of the major solar companies recently on the, on the CEO of the thesis. Uh, why don't you offer that if somebody will let you put solar on their roof on your usual shared savings basis, you'll write them a $1,000 check as a commission up front? Mm. And he turned to his head of marketing and, and said, that sounds really good for our low-income customers that we've been having trouble attracting, what would happen if we did that? And the head of marketing said, we couldn't answer the phone fast enough. <laughs> sure. We have time for maybe one more question. And if not, let's thank Amory again. Thanks. Thanks.